You know, it's interesting that nothing and, and something appear simultaneously. They're like different different sides of the same coin. You don't know what nothing is unless there's a something that contrasts with it. And in fact, that was one of the bases that I I began my my first book called Enlightenment for Beginners was exactly that, starting off with this this nothingness. And by the time I finished my my series of about five books, I I actually wrote a book called uh, Looking for God, Seeing the Hole in One. And there's a one inch hole that we drilled through the very center of the book where everybody is pointing at that because I I realized that words will just take you so far. Um, You can fall into the void. You can fall into into this emptiness. Um, But there's nothing there that's tangible, nothing that, that you can hang on to or cling to. And you have to let go of the the emptiness, which is empty even of its own emptiness, which is paradoxical. But I've I've realized, I've long since realized that the moment that you start to talk about non-duality is the very moment that that you start muddying the waters. Because non-duality cannot be grasped. And the moment that you use very dualistic words in order to contain it in some way is the very moment that, that it begins to slip away and you don't have it at all. And what you're left with is what you began with, just this emptiness and this silence that always is there within the very heart of who you are. It's, it's, a, it's a perception, I suppose, or a point of view or a belief that, that says that any separation that you see and perceive or believe in is really an illusion. And, and it's quite interesting when you think about all of the great spiritual religions and the great spiritual philosophies, every single one of them has a non-dual component that weaves itself through all of the uh, their their tenets and their beliefs. There's always someplace deep inside there is something about non non dual, and non duality really says everything is an illusion, and that everything is really quintessentially only one thing, and and that same uh, tenet, that same fundamental truth is repeated in all of the great spiritual religions and, and philosophies. So it's not something rare or, or unusual or otherworldly or over there only in, in India or Southeast Asia that non, non-duality appears. That's really the truth of, of what it is, but that's just the word that we, we use. In, um, in Hinduism, uh, they describe it as Advaita, and Advaita doesn't even say that everything is one. It, it actually, I, I believe it translates as not two, not two. So it, it says it's not that. And what it is, is this one, but we're not even going to say it's one. We're going to say it's not two. Free will is an illusion, really. And uh, I, I've often use the um, the analogy of you know there's Romeo and Juliet we've all seen Romeo and Juliet do Romeo does Romeo does Juliet do they have free will now when you're seeing the play it seems like they're making these decisions that are spontaneously springing up from the core of the action and and their love for each other but can they arbitrarily unilaterally choose to to commit suicide at the end or not to they have no choice about that they that's part of who they are that suicide flows naturally uh, from their actions and from their behavior but it appears from another point of view from the audience's point of view that they're making specific um, answers about or specific decisions about this and that they do have choice and agency here but in in truth they really don't uh, and that's it's part of the great freedom that comes with with i, I think a non-dual perspective is a realization that um, although it, it seems like and it's i suppose at some level it's important to appear and to live your life as if that were so 
but free will is really an illusion. That there's, there's nobody there really that has that free will. There's no separate person that, that has this agency concerning something else. And time is like um, consciousness living dangerously. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's a way of keeping the, the dualistic perspective um, stoking the dualistic perspective because you have this illusion or this story that there's a linearity of time and that at one point way back decades ago you were quote unquote born and then you were a little kid and then you went to school and then you you know, graduated and you did this adventure and that misadventure, and then you got married and divorced and had kids. And then you're moving along this line going on towards some distant point where you know the, the story of who you think you are, the body is not going to have a happy ending. But you're on that. And, and it seems like that linearity of time is an important factor in order for you to maintain the illusion that everything is not this moment, and instead, there is truly a history and historical ego based past that you're living out of, and that there's going to be some kind of imaginary future that you're living into. But that's not true at all. All everything is just right here and right now. This truly is it. For who is this illusion? You know, there has to be somebody there that separates themselves from that and says, oh, that's that's an illusion. Um, but if there is no separation, then the world is just what it is. Um, but the illusion is the consciousness. And I remember Shankara's um, three-part thing that he wrote, I think it was around 17 or 715 or so AD. He said, the, the world is an illusion and the only reality is brahman or consciousness and then the third part kind of flips it around it says consciousness is the world the world is consciousness so even though it's an illusion it still is that and that's that's really the great paradox and where words really let off and that's one of the reasons like i said why i created that book with the whole middle because it's like you have to let go of the words. You have to let go of the definitions. You can't figure this stuff out. It's unfigure outable. It's ungraspable. It's not something that you can um, lay out scientifically because, in truth, it flies in the face of logic, of reason, of it's absolutely nonsensical. And can you can you be comfortable with with the fact that it cannot be grasped? And and as the Zen in the Zen tradition, they talk about uh, get to a place where not knowing, not understanding that that you're okay with not knowing, with not understanding, and just instead just a sense of being being. That's it. <laughs> well, the biggest cosmic joke is that you are who you are looking for. <laughs> You're struggling so hard to get to a place where you already are. Uh, but but uh and and this is this is part of the ego ego's uh quest to actually go through all this stuff and it's interesting because as much as the ego says, "Oh, I want this enlightenment, I want this awakening." At the same time, there's another energy in the ego that doesn't want to get that close to it. Wants to maybe come really close, but then pull back at the last minute, kind of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory because it knows, hey, once it goes into that, the game is up. Um, there, is, there is going to be like a, a personal annihilation of everything that the ego says. This is who I am. This is, <clears throat> these are my thoughts. These are my feelings. These are my words these are my actions that sense of personal ownership will be lost at that point and the ego is is torn in that so it wants it and yet there's another part so it has that's really the worst kind of conflict they call it approach 
avoidance. So it wants to approach that, but it wants to avoid it at the same time. The ego, it's not a who, it's really kind of a bundle of thoughts that are loosely gathered around um, an ever-changing point of view. And this point of view is, is fallen in love with itself, really. That it, it says uh, that I am, I am the thinker. Um, I am the feeler of the feelings. I am the speaker of these words. I am the doer of these actions. I am this. All of these things have the source within me as the ego. And it's, it's kind of like um, software and hardware in a computer. The ego is software, but it likes to pretend that it's hardware, that it's part and parcel of who you are, but it's not that. It's been constructed, uh, fabricated, if you want to go back and tell a story about it, when you were like quite young, you know, within the first year or so, a sense of personal self, where you stop and where the mother begins or the bottle begins. But there's that separation at that point. But until that point, uh, there is no differentiation. It's the differentiation that, that creates the ego. But it's just yeah, like, a, like a costume that, that the cosmic actor puts on, falls in love with, and believes that it is that character in the play. And, that's, and, and it's very difficult because if, you're, if you truly believe that you are the character in this, in this cosmic drama <clears throat> and, and you have identified that, then whatever happens um, in the drama to, with, or for that particular character, um, you believe is happening to you because you are, in fact, that character. You've identified yourself so completely. So you don't say, I'm playing the part of, you say, I am this through and through. This is who I am. It's my DNA, my genetic structure. I am this, I am this character in the play. Um, but you don't even see it as a character and you don't even see it as a play. You believe that all of that is real.